Thank you all for coming today. I appreciate it. Do you all know what anniversary it is today by any chance? No, actually. <laughs> it's not. It's the anniversary year, but it's not the anniversary. Anybody know what anniversary it is? It's my parents' anniversary. It's your parents' anniversary. All right. That's right. This is a good crowd. This is what we need. We'll feed off energy off of each other. Today is the day, April the 12th, 1961, is the day that the first human being went into space. Yuri Gagarin, a Soviet cosmonaut. And I would, I would venture to say that in a thousand years, if Lone Star College is still here and they're still teaching history classes, that may be the one thing from the 20th century that people actually notice, that we went into space and maybe beyond that. This topic has, in a way, I've been doing a lot of reflecting on it. It has some personal connection for me uh, because as I put that on the screen, you'll notice that's the celebration that took place in Mission Control when Neil Armstrong and Michael Collins and Buzz Aldrin landed in the ocean. But if you take a look right there at that guy, that's my father-in-law. He worked on that. He got in Clear Lake, Texas in 1966, and there he is just overjoyed with what he had done. Uh, and there's been nothing else like it, you know. I also, too, I have to say, this has some resonance for me personally because I taught in Clear Lake and I was walking back into class in 1986 when I heard that the Challenger disaster had occurred and we had a couple of the uh, students of those uh, kids, of those parents uh, in the school. So this, this is something that has been a part of my life. It's, I've done a lot of reading for this, but so I want to share with you some of the things that I found today. I'll be very clear, I am not an expert on this. So if you have questions, and I hope you do, you may hear me say, I don't know, because <laughs> there's a lot of things that I still don't know about this. Now, when we think about, here we, here we go. Okay, so when we think about, first of all, why did the U.S. even go into space, right? Why do that? Part of that had to do with the idea of Sputnik. The Soviets launched a satellite in 1957, and this alarmed Americans. So the United States going into space in part was something to do with the Cold War, right? But that's not the only reason we went into space. There's a lot of other reasons that we went into space as well. Believe it or not, a big part of it was science fiction. That a lot of, a lot of novels published over the last 100 years or so prior to Sputnik had elaborated on the idea that we could travel in space. And uh, so that when Sputnik occurred, the public mind was prepared for the idea that it was possible. Does that make sense to everybody? Uh, Jules Verne, From the Earth to the Moon, and other, uh, other uh, novels. Uh, there's also simply an international fascination with space. Things like uh, scientists like Robert Goddard, uh, Russian scientists, uh, German scientists, all interested in, can we do this? Can we actually go into space? And then, this is something I've learned a lot about, I knew a little bit about it, but World War II is very important as well. And the fact of the matter is that former Nazi scientists were important to the development of the space program. How many of y'all knew that, by the way? A few of you did. But in a, in a intelligence operation called Operation Paperclip, some German scientists that had worked on Vengeance rockets or V2 rockets, they were brought over to the United States. They were originally stationed in Fort Bliss, Texas, and then eventually they ended up in Huntsville, Alabama. And Huntsville, Alabama really kind of became an, an original tech hub in the United States uh, in the 1960s, led by the German scientist and SS officer named Werner von Braun. And then there is also uh, the idea of the frontier in America. This had always been a part of American thinking, that the frontier is what defined us. It's what made, the idea that what made us what we are as a people, made us inventive, made us risk-taking. All of these things kind of coalesced around the, so that when Sputnik was launched in 1957, this small satellite, maybe the size of a basketball, the American mind was prepared for 
we can do this. We can go into space. Okay? But that doesn't explain why we went to the moon. Going to the space is one thing, correct? But going to the moon is something entirely different. So why did the United States go to the moon? And that's the next question. That's what I want to talk about next, uh, if I can get this to work. Okay, so anybody know what these are? What's this a picture of? It's a picture, between, a picture of a debate between John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon. These were, this was the first presidential debate that was ever held. We're very used to those now, but this was held in 1960, and actually the space race came up in these debates. Uh, that in fact, at one point when Nixon was vice president, and I should at this point acknowledge my debt to historians like Douglas Brinkley and Roger Launius, much of what I say today is based upon their work, but at one point Nixon as vice president had debated uh, Khrushchev, the Soviet premier, in what was called a so-called famous kitchen debate. And Nixon had told Khrushchev, see what capitalism can produce, we can produce these better appliances. And, and Kennedy in one of these debates said to Nixon, you, you want to produce domestic products that's better than the Soviets. I want to be number one in payload in getting to space. So it actually came up in the debates and Kennedy himself was, he, it may interest you to know, he never lost an election. And as he, he ran for president when he was, what, 42, 43, and as he told an advisor once, he said, you got to have some real moxie to run for president when you're 42 years old. And he was elected, okay? Now, and not long after Kennedy takes office, on this very day, for 58 years ago, the first man goes into space, Yuri Gagarin, and returns to Earth safely, okay? And he becomes a national hero. He really becomes an international hero. You can see this commemor commemorative stamp in the Soviet Union for him. Gagarin died seven years later in a plane crash. He was flying a test jet, and another uh, plane came too close. Didn't hit him, but it caused his engines to fail, and he died in 1968. It's one of the interesting things of the moon landing that the astronauts left several things on the moon, but one of the things they left were commemorative medals for Soviet cosmonauts that had died uh, in, in attempting to go to the moon or go to space themselves. I think that's really cool that American astronauts did that. So Kennedy initiates a space program, and these are the first American astronauts called the Mercury 7, and there's the first man, American in space, named Alan Shepard, and there you see a picture of Kennedy and his wife Jackie to Kennedy's left, Ken my laser's not working, and Lyndon Johnson is on the far left. They were all very interested in would this succeed or not, right, because nobody really knew. Uh, and even now, if you pay attention to the newspapers at all, you know that rockets fail from time to time. So uh, Shepard comes back into space. I thought this was a funny quote of Alan Shepard's he says, it's a very sobering feeling to be up in space and realize that one's safety factor was determined by the lowest bidder on a government contract. <laughs> you got to love that, that, that quotation. So Kennedy invites Shepard to the White House after he gets back to Earth. His original flight was only 15 minutes. And Kennedy is stunned by what a celebrity Shepard is. Everywhere these guys go, they are mobbed, all of these astronauts. Well, any good politician is going to do what with people that are popular? They're going to piggyback on that, right? Uh, even though, as Kennedy said, I hear all you guys are Republicans when he first uh, met the Mercury 7 astronauts, and they all looked at each other like, well, yeah, but they didn't know what to say. Uh, so at any rate, Shepard's the first person in space. So why does the United States go to the moon? for very particular reasons. Okay, so Sputnik launches on October the 4th, 1957. That's what prompts the United States to go into space, among other things. Then, uh, Yuri Gagarin, he goes into space on April the 12th, 1961. Is everybody following this, right? Five days later, Something very, it's a disaster for the Kennedy administration. The Bay of Pigs invasion occurs. 
where the Kennedy administration supported a CIA attempted coup in Cuba, and it failed, and it's national news, and Kennedy looks incompetent. Kennedy looks weak. And so now he starts thinking, and Kennedy's a, he's a very competitive guy, right? He's a really competitive guy, and he sends a memo to Lyndon Johnson. And he, in this memo, he says to Johnson, and here's Kennedy at NASA, and he says to Johnson, do we have a chance of beating the Soviets by a trip around the moon or by a rocket to the moon and back with a man? Is there any other space program which promises dramatic results in which we can, what's the word? Win. Kennedy considered himself a winner, and he felt like the United States was getting beat in space, and he didn't like it. And Johnson replies, Lyndon Johnson replies in a memo, the U.S. must recognize that other nations will tend to align themselves with the country which they believe will be the world leader, the winner in the long run. Dramatic accomplishments in space are being increasingly identified as a major indicator of world leadership. So a big motivation for going to the moon is simply national prestige. That's just part of it. It's, a, it's part of the Cold War, but it's also the makeup of these two men. Because LBJ supported the space program as much as Kennedy did and was instrumental in seeing it continue. Okay? Now, uh, and there you see Kennedy, he did like to visit NASA. There you see Kennedy with his sunglasses on. Whenever he went to NASA, he always wore sunglasses to try and bring some glamour to the place, he said. Uh, and to his left there, is the inventor of the Saturn V, to his right is Werner von Braun, the former Nazi scientist. And Kennedy had fought in World War II as well, and he never held von Braun's Nazi past against him. Kennedy, I think he, in a way, I guess you could say he kind of had an amoral streak to his character, but he kind of figured war was just one of those things where people do crappy things and he never really held it against him. Uh, a lot of Americans didn't really know the extent of Von Braun's Nazi involvement. We know a lot more about that now, and it's more troubling to know of his involvement with the uh, uh, Nazi V2 rockets now, more so than then. Let's see. Come on. Yeah. Okay, so Kennedy goes to Congress in May of 1961, and he says, we want to send a man to the moon and return him safely to Earth. Kennedy goes before Congress, and he, he challenges the country to go to the moon. And this is audacious, very audacious. And it's going to cost what? It's going to cost not just money, but a lot of money. And this is now look, Kennedy's father, at least according to Douglas Brinkley, Brinkley, he heard this speech, and Kennedy's father's like, I knew he was going to mess up. And he calls the White House. He's like, this is a huge mistake because you don't know if it's going to succeed. America barely has a space program when he, when he says this, right? Commits the country to doing this. And notice the specificity of the dates. And Kennedy really does go out and try to sell this program to the American people, and he's a very effective salesman. He comes to uh, Houston about a year later, and at Rice University, Kennedy gives a speech uh, at Rice, and it's mostly freshmen, youngsters in the audience. It's the first week of September. You can imagine how hot it was in Houston at September. And Kennedy essentially says, that we choose to go to the moon in this decade, not because it's easy, but because it's what? It's hard. We're doing this because if we're going to be a great nation, we have to do great things. And in, in an analogy he uses in the crowd, he says, why does Rice play Texas? Because it's hard. You know, nowadays we laugh, but, you know, people laughed at the time. So he's a very, he's a very effective salesman for this space program uh, in the 1960s. Now, uh, and in 1963, it may surprise you to know that the Soviets beat the United States again. Uh, they put the first female astronaut into space, Valentina Tereshkova. 
uh, and in 1963. Now this did not, and I think it says something, that this did not produce the controversy that Sputnik did. And I think I have an answer as to why that is in just a second. But this also stirred worldwide some real uh, interest. And here you see, for example, uh, communist, uh, uh, Ange I think she was a member of the Communist Party, is that right, Steve? Angela Davis there to the left of Tereshkova, uh, very pleased that the Soviets had done this first, not the Americans. Now, the Soviets didn't put another woman into space for another, I think, 19 years, but they did put the first woman into space. And there was, in the United States, were there any female astronauts? Actually, there were. And I want to talk about that a little bit. And here is a, a, a Jerry Cobb, is her name, uh, there were females that did take all the tests that astronauts took out at the Lovelace Tasting Center, Testing Center in New Mexico. And Jerry Cobb did everything she could to try to get women to be part of the program. Now, the advantage that women had was, was twofold. They, they don't weigh as much. And in space, weight matters because to lift to get that escape velocity right y'all know what i'm talking about here that escape velocity even 10 pounds can make a difference okay the other thing is those capsules were so small that no astronaut could be taller than five foot eleven every astronaut had to be shorter than that gagarin was five foot two which was an advantage. So the shorter you were, the better it was. And women were a little shorter. So these women, 13 of them, they were called the, the Mercury 13. They did go through all these tests that the male astronauts went through. And did they pass them? The answer to that is they did. They did very, very well on these tests. But the women, uh, the, the United States does not send a woman to space until 20 years later in 1963. Why? If they passed the test, then why didn't they get to do that? Well, okay, this is very interesting. This is very personal, and I'll tell you why in just a second. Now, there's a picture of some of those Mercury 13 astronauts at NASA in 1995 to celebrate the first female commander, uh, Eileen Collins, commanding a space shuttle flight. There's Jerry Cobb right there, uh, third from the left. Now, Cobb actually went to Congress and spoke. It testified before a, before a House committee, and notice what she says. We, we simply want to be part of the nation's future in space. Look at the photo. And what's she doing in the photo? She's taking her shoes off. And that became the story in the newspapers the next day. Not what she said, but that she had the audacity to take off her shoes in public. It's a great country, right? You know? Now, but what was decisive here, and this is very interesting to me, what was decisive was John Glenn testified the next day. And notice what he said to the Congress. He's an astronaut. I think this gets back to the way our social order is organized, really. It is just a fact. The men go off and fight the wars and fly the airplanes and come back. The fact that women are not in this field is a fact of our social order. It may be undesirable. What's he saying here? Women shouldn't be what? Astronauts. And Glenn was a national hero, and when he said this, this was decisive. And that was it for female astronauts in the United States at that point. Now, I bring this up. I said this was personal because I bring this up that Glenn gave this testimony on the day that I was born, <laughs> July the 8th, 1962. And my, how the country has changed. And I think part of the reason that Jerry Cobb, and this is Margaret Weidekamp, the historian, has made this point, that part of the reason that Jerry Cobb did not succeed and others in getting uh, in getting to become an astronaut was there was no women's movement yet to press the matter publicly in an organized way. And I think that's a, 
that's kind of a lesson for no matter what political group is pressuring for change in the United States, good. You'll want that, people advancing these ideas. So that is why I think we didn't get uh, women in space until the 1980s for the United States because of various social matters. You'll see Glenn is really saying that this is natural, that our social order is natural. He's not saying it's made or constructed. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So notice what Claire Booth Luce said about this. I think this is a great quote. The most important reason men will not for a long time accept women in the astronaut program is that in this field, as in most others, men somehow think their virility and masculinity depend upon establishing and maintaining their intellectual and physical superiority in it. Now this is instructive because Claire Booth Luce was a conservative and her husband was Henry Luce who ran and owned Life Magazine. And Life Magazine had contracts with NASA that the astronauts profited from financially. Uh, so for her to say this was actually kind of co really courageous, you know, uh, to criticize this. Uh, and really, Claire Booth Luce, a remarkable woman in so many ways, a uh, remarkable American. Now, this too, I think, and I want to bring this out. Have any of y'all seen the movie Hid Hidden Figures? Yes, how many of y'all have seen that? Okay, if you haven't, I, I, it's a nice, sweet film. But this is one of the protagonists in the film, uh, Catherine Johnson. She was a computer at Langley, NASA Langley in Virginia. And notice what she says. The whole idea of going into space was what? It was, it was new, it was daring. And that fit with Kennedy's persona too, because Kennedy was young, he was new, he was daring, right? That's the way he tried to portray himself anyway. Uh, and... I put that second quote in there because I think that's just a great model for any of us. What are you interested in? Take the courses that you're interested in, right? Find out what you're interested in. Find other people that are interested in the same things. Pursue those things. So, but again, the newness of going into space. Now, she was an African-American. Here's another quote from a, a female computer at NASA, Margaret Hamilton, and notice what she said. She said, I was so busy. <laughs> I, I was oblivious to the fact that I was outnumbered by men. I didn't even notice it. And here, my father-in-law, Tom, wrote this for me. Here's what my father-in-law, Tom, it, said to me when he said this about a month ago. He said, it is interesting to me that I don't recall any particular outstanding experience during the Apollo 11 mission. We were so focused on the task at hand that it took 50 years of reflection to realize what we accomplished. And I know there were some engineers at NASA that in late in the 60s, they got so busy working on the moon landing seven days a week, they would see Vietnam protesters and things like that. They'd be like, who are those people? They missed the whole, they missed the 60s, right? They were so busy with the work. But I bet if you talk to almost anybody that worked at NASA on this stuff, worked on the Apollo program, that they are very, very proud of what they've done and very, very proud of their country. My wife and I were having, my wife over here, we were having dinner the other night with a couple of friends who were from Canada, and they said to us, that they remembered the moon landing, and they said, that is America at its best. Anyway, so just to, and there's, there is the picture of engineers, the Apollo 11 black team. There's my father-in-law, Tom, with the glasses in the front row, but what you'll notice is it's all what? It's all men and it's all white men, right? And that's, that is the social order of the time. America has changed uh, markedly in that time period. Uh, but uh, there they are, very proud of what they've done. They, had, they called the different teams that worked on the missions by color, black, yellow, et cetera, okay? Uh, now, the Apollo program, it was not an unqualified triumph. Apollo 1, these three astronauts actually died in the capsule running a test. Have y'all ever heard of that by any chance? And it was simply called the fire. They were running a test program. They weren't even launching that day. And in the capsule, the, uh, the, the, ca the, 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 the command module was 100% oxygen, pure oxygen. And a wire shorted out, and it started a fire. And 
it was so quick that the people back in mission control heard one of the astronauts, they think, I think it was Ed White, say fire, and then they were dead seconds later. And a lot, at least from what I've read, this was a transformative event for NASA, that almost more so than Apollo 11. My father-in-law, Tom, he says that they actually knew they would be successful by Apollo 11, that they, they had done the work, they had done the preparation, right? So, uh, and there is what the capsule looked like. Um, and again, it was just a test. Three people died in that. And NASA, it, it really threatened whether or not they would fulfill Kennedy's pledge to get the moon, to the moon in 1968 or not. But uh, they, they, NASA underwent a massive evaluation of what had gone wrong and changed the way the, co the capsule was wired, uh, what, uh, what air they put in the capsule. It was no longer 100% oxygen and things of that nature. Uh, and this is from, I believe, 2017, uh, a, a tribute to those astronauts. And it says, a rough road leads to the stars. And it's difficult not to admire people that are willing in any, and we forget this, the, the, the Apollo missions that, and all space missions, they become routine in our own minds, but the fact is they're never routine. As Elon Musk says, space is hard. So uh, the next, one of the na next major missions was the kind of called the Earthrise mission, but this was the one where they first, the Apollo 8, they first circled the moon. And when they came around the moon, they saw, they saw the earth rising up above it. And you can watch the video of this. All you got to do is Google Earthrise and you'll get it. And you'll hear the astronauts go, oh boy. You know, and astronauts don't talk that way. They're very matter of fact. Oh, get, get the camera. And then they're like, oh, get the color camera. You know, and, but, and this was the first time that really this had ever occurred where you could look at the planet from space. And this occurs on Christmas Eve, 1968. And they read, they read portions of the first chapter from Genesis on Christmas Eve. And that actually became very controversial uh, because of this woman, Madeline Murray O'Hare, uh, the most hated woman in America, some people said. She said she uh, uh, had a letter writing campaign that you cannot read scripture in a public uh, 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 program like that from space. And tens of thousands of letters came into NASA supporting what the astronauts had done, which was kind of interesting. I think it's the most letters that NASA ever received was in response to that. However, I think it's very interesting. I want to, why was Apollo 8 so significant? Well, think about 1968. January 1st, 68 to December the 21st, Christmas Eve. What happens in the country that year? Well, that's the Tet Offensive in Vietnam when it becomes clear the United States is not going to win that war. Okay, next you have in Vietnam, the My Lai Massacre becomes public knowledge. Not long after that, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. is assassinated. Not long after that, on national television, Robert Kennedy is assassinated. And then you have, in, uh, not long after that, you have riots in Chicago at the Democratic Convention there. And then after that, Nixon wins the presidency in a very, very close race. So this is the first presidential election I ever remember. And they announced it the next day at lunch. I do remember that. And so the Apollo, NASA received one telegram that said this, Apollo 8, you saved 1968. Because that was such a controversial year in American history uh, and world history. So at any rate, now there's also concerns about NASA is going to the moon worth it financially. And here you see a cartoon, and thanks to Roger Lanius for this, this is a cartoon from the, I think it's a Baltimore, a black newspaper in Baltimore, decrying the fact that the United States is making progress in space, but it's not making progress in race. That th these monies that are being invested in NASA could be invested, and this is Martin Luther King Jr.'s successor to the Southern Christian Leadership Conference 
America has reached out to the stars, but has not reached out to its starving poor. Now, Abernathy, I think, I think he went to the Apollo 11 uh, launch, and he was very impressed by it. But nevertheless, they wanted some of those monies uh, put into their own community. So it's important to know that NASA, the moon landing, etc., this was always somewhat controversial. It never was an unqualified uh, triumph for America, in a sense. And so we can't look back on it with too much nostalgia. Uh, and now there is an example of a Norman Rockwell painting and uh, for Apo celebrating Apollo. And there you see every person in there is, of course, uh, white. And, but uh, here you see the first African-American astronaut, Robert Lawrence, who had a PhD, by the way. He was selected to be an astronaut in June of 1967, and he died in a plane crash in a few months later. That, this is a really risky job doing this. It's very, it's very life-threatening. Uh, and then the first African-American woman to go into space is in 1992, May Jameson. I think she now lives in Decatur, Alabama, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so moving right along, almost there. So, boy, I really would like to show this clip, but I don't have the... Here, this is a... If you Google this at home, you can... You can see this, just Whitey on the moon. Uh, and it's a criticism of that, you know, I'm starving, but hey, Whitey's on the moon. My sister can't get health care, but Whitey's on the moon. I can't, get, I can't get my appendix taken out or whatever operation I need, but hey, Whitey's on the moon. It's kind of a, it's, it's a poem, uh, but I'll leave it at that. So for some reason, the, the computer's not working. So there you see the Apollo 11 crew. On the left is Neil Armstrong. In the middle is Michael Collins. And on the right is Buzz Aldrin. And these are all three very uh, interesting individuals. They, they weren't great friends. I think it was Michael Collins that said they were amiable strangers. Uh, Neil Armstrong was from Ohio. He was uh, kind of what people, he was what people called unflappable. Uh, he, was a test, he was a test pilot. He fought dozens and dozens of missions in the Korean War. In fact, he almost got killed a few times in the Korean War flying jets. Michael Collins was uh, kind of a, a, a thinker. Uh, he's going to be the guy that flies around the moon while they're down on the moon. And at least, I haven't read it yet, but people tell me that his... Uh, memoir of this called Carrying the Fire is the best of all the astronaut memoirs. And I thought I would read you just one bit of it for, uh, for a second to help you, he, I think, he understand. He's really such a good writer. He says, when I looked back at the earth from the moon, if I could use only one word to describe the tiny thing, it would have been fragile. A totally unexpected reaction but fragile turns out, unfortunately, to be accurate in a thousand ways. World population in 69 was more than 3 billion, is now more than 6, and will be 8 or so when the next lunar heroes and celebrities look back. I don't think this growth is healthy or sustainable, but our economic models are predicated on growth. They require it. Grow or die, or maybe both. The dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico is now larger than New Jersey and still growing. The growth of death, a terrible thing to do to this planet. This one example alone makes me want to cry, and countless other catastrophes abound, some lurking in the future, many already here. We need a new economic paradigm to produce prosperity without growth. I fervently hope some of you reading this can help reverse today's ominous trends, but as for me, I'm going fishing. Take care. <laughs> so, uh, he, very, very thoughtful guy. Love fine wines, good books, painting. On the right is Buzz Aldrin. On the very first date that Buzz Aldrin went on with his wife, Joan, he told her, and this was the 50s, the person who's going to walk on the moon is alive today in America. Her reaction, this is a crazy person. She thought he was nuts, right? But he turned out to be right. He also 
He got his PhD in aeronautics from MIT. And what he got it in was uh, getting spacecraft in, Earth, in, in orbit to, to rendezvous. And he was obsessed with it. And hence at NASA, his term, the nickname for him was, guess, Dr. Rendezvous was his name. Now, there was a lot of controversy about, if you think about it, it's going to be Aldrin and Armstrong that are going to descend to the moon. Who's going to go out first? And Aldrin really wanted to be first. And he actually talked to Neil Armstrong about it. And Neil Armstrong, in a kind of his slight taciturn way, said, well, it's going to be a historical figure, so I guess I'd kind of like it to be me, maybe, you know, if it's going to be anybody. Although Armstrong really may have kind of come to regret that. But this is an interesting thing that um, who's going to be out of the lunar lander first. And this is from the book First Man that the movie was based upon. And there was some discussion in NASA. And this is uh, <clears throat> some NASA folks talking. They said, look, we just knew damn well that the first guy on the moon was going to be a Lindbergh. You know, Charles Lindbergh, the first man that flew across the Atlantic. He's going to be the guy for time immemorial that's going to be known as the guy that set foot on the moon first. And who do we want that to be? The first man on the moon would be a legend, an American hero beyond Lindbergh, beyond any soldier or politician or inventor. It should be Neil Armstrong. Neil was calm. Neil was quiet. Neil was confident. Neil was Neil. And so it was, it was uh, Armstrong that went out of the lunar lander first in 1969. Now, this was dangerous. That's the lunar lander there, and this is pictures of Neil Armstrong trying to learn how to fly it, and he almost died doing that. And you can see uh, that it looks like an insect, and there you can see on the lower right, there Armstrong actually had to eject from the lunar lander uh, to do this uh, in this test flight. Pete Conrad, who flew Apollo 12, he said landing on the moon, and he had 20 years of flight experience, he said landing on the moon was the most difficult thing I ever did as an aviator. Because as they got closer to the moon, it kicked up dust from the moon. It was very difficult to even know if you did land, right? So uh, now there you have the morning of the, of the launch. They have their traditional steak and egg breakfast. This is very different than a Soviet tradition. In the Soviet Union, in 1961, when Yuri Gagarin took his flight on the way to the launch pad, he had to take a piss. So he took a piss against the back right tire of the, of the, of the, of the bus that he was on, and that became a tradition that still holds in Russia. Okay, And here you have Scott Kelly. Y'all know who Scott Kelly is, spent a year in space. He's in the newspapers today about his twin and he doing experiments on that, uh, on the effects of, of being in space. He said, soon we are moving. After a while, the bus slows, then comes to a stop well before the launch pad. We nod at one another, step off, and take up our positions. We all have undone the rubber band seals that have been so carefully and publicly leak checked just an hour before. Okay, I center myself in front of the front, in front of the right rear tire, and reach into my Sokol suit. I don't really have to pee, but it is a tradition. When Yuri Gagarin was on his way to the launch pad for his first historic space flight, he asked to pull over and peed on the right rear tire of the bus. Then he went to space and came back alive. So now we must all do the same. <laughs> so, but they, you know, you get superstitious, right? Uh, these scientists. Uh, and they do launch, and there is Lyndon Johnson at the launch site. Anybody know how many people came to watch this? 30? Almost a million people. A million people came to Florida to watch this launch, and there's just one example of it. And if you go see that documentary, Apollo 11, it's all original NASA footage, the first part of it is all showing you all these Americans, a quarter of a million at least Americans, simply to come out to watch this occur. And even critics of the space program, like 
that would watch these Saturn V rockets, it might have been Norman Mailer, I may be wrong about this, but that when, the, when the, the Saturn V goes up, their reaction is, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, that you simply cannot forget it if you've seen that. So they do, uh, and I, th I do want to mention a couple of people, just ordinary Americans that helped people land on the moon. And this is a guy named John Hulbolt. He was an engineer. In other words, he might be you. He might be you. He might be you. He might be you. He's just somebody who's interested in engineering. He's in his 20s. And when they thought that they were going to go to the moon, they actually thought they would launch a rocket and then they would just simply go to the moon and put the brakes on, so to speak, and land that rocket on the moon. And Hubolt was the guy that's like, no, that's not going to work. We're going to have to we're going to have to put a, a lunar lander or lunar module in the Saturn V rocket. We're going to have to rendezvous in space because it's going to be less weight to get the escape, escape velocity in the rocket. And when he first proposes this, there are some NASA scientists that say, your numbers lie. And he presses for this and presses for this and presses for this eventually writing nine-page memos to explain why this has to be the case, and the facts went out. And so they, you lift off into space, then you detach the lunar module from the command module, and then you redock, and then the lunar lander separates from the command module as the lunar lander goes down to the surface of the moon. It's incredibly complicated. And so Mike Collins is the one circling the moon, right? He's the one circling the moon in the command module while the lunar lander of Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin is, is going down to the surface. And you know what Mike Collins worried about the most? What if those guys don't make it back? I'll have to go back to Earth alone, and they'll be left on the planet on the moon by themselves. And Nixon, Nixon was the president at the time, and Nixon's speechwriters, they had to write two speeches, one if they live and one if they die, if they stay on the moon, if they can't get off the moon. And here's a guy, Steve Bales, another young engineer, right? And here's a guy that when Armstrong is descending towards the moon, alarms start going off in the lunar module. Well, do you abort the mission or not? And Bales knew the computers well enough and the, and the cell phones you've got in your hands or in your pockets or those of you who are dying to look at it right now okay that those cell phones are more powerful than the computers that they used okay and Bales knew that the reason the alarms were going off on the way down to the surface is that the computer just couldn't keep up with all the information that was being processed so while everybody was saying do we abort he was like we're a go we're a go he knew the system and therefore uh, it, it, they landed. And there is Neil Armstrong's footprint on the moon. Now, it may surprise you to know that we don't have any pictures of Neil Armstrong on the moon. The only one we have is where he descends the ladder of the TV camera. They got so busy with what they were doing, they didn't take any. They took, Neil took pictures of Buzz Aldrin, but Buzz Aldrin did not, we don't, I don't think, maybe one or two, but of Neil Armstrong. Now, some people have said Aldrin was upset that he wasn't out first, but I, I don't really think, I don't get that that's really true. I, I think it was just they got busy, and Neil Armstrong said, look, we were really busy. I don't think he ever held really a grudge about it or anything. They left this plaque on the moon, here men from the planet Earth first set foot upon the moon, July 1969 A.D. They also left a silicon disk on the moon, of all sorts of uh, messages from world leaders, uh, music and everything else. Uh, one of the world leaders that left a message on this silicon disk was, uh, let's see here, yes, from Costa Rica, Joaquin Trejos Fernandez. And on this, his message says, I join in the wish of all Costa Ricans for the success of the historical exploit to be carried out by Apollo 11. It represents the scientific and technical progress attained by man in his peaceful struggle for the conquest of space. And in that crew of this ship 
represents human valor, will, spirit of adventure, and ingenuity. Beautiful, beautiful statement. And then, of course, they also left a piece from the Kitty Hawk from the Wright Brothers plane. Uh, they took that to the moon and back from Kitty Hawk to Tranquility Base. Nice touch. They arrived back to Earth. There's the celebration. You can't quite, there's my father-in-law right there smiling, right? But up on the screen, they have Kennedy's pledge to the left. And in the middle, it says task accomplished after eight years of work. So we, and there you see the astronauts in quarantine because they did not know if they brought back germs from the moon that might kill people. Uh, and there's Nixon to the right. And Nixon said, this is the greatest week since creation. And Billy Graham sent him a telegram says, not so fast. Okay. <laughs> I think there's other things that were more important. But at any rate, there, a ticker tape parade in New York. None of these men ever fly as astronauts again. Um, they do a goodwill tour across the nation. And they're treated almost like religious figures. Here they are in New York City. Here they are in Mexico. You can see the crowds, right? You got to love it. Uh, here they are uh, uh, with the Pope. Uh, they become international celebrities. And their, their lives are never the same. And their lives are never their own again, really, in a way, too. Certainly not Armstrong's, uh, for sure. Uh, and the last man to uh, land on the moon was in 1972, uh, Eugene Cernan. And notice... Again, that phrase, we return with what? The peace and hope for all mankind. And I was talking, I was, I was talking with the author of First Man a couple weeks ago when I was in Huntsville, Alabama. And he said that, you know, would we today as Americans have such a universal aspect to what we were doing on the moon? Or would we view it so triumphantly as simply an American achievement? Uh, alone. And, I, and he didn't have an answer for that, and we didn't talk about it too much, but I thought it was an interesting question. Uh, so, real quickly, almost done. Thank you for hanging in there with me. There's pizza awaiting you, I hope, right? All right. So, what did the Apollo achieve? Well, first of all, it's just an, what did it achieve? It, the, the task is accomplished, and, there's all, and it's an enormously complicated task, and, and that alone is significant, okay? Uh, also, uh, they do a lot of geological work on the moon. The last, the last Apollo, Apollo 17, actually takes a geologist to the moon. But to know what the moon is made of gives you clues to how the universe formed. And I should also say, and I made sure that the bookstore had these today, I've got a few copies here for you. This is the book to buy on the Apollo moon landings, and I would encourage you to do so. And if you really can't afford it, if you give me a good reason, I'll probably buy it for you. Okay? But you got to give me a damn good reason. <laughs> All right? So, but at any rate, no, it's, it's a great book, really well worth, well worth reading. Uh, certainly the technology that comes out of this is important. Do you all use GPS? Where do you think that comes from? Right? Satellites. Do you all watch ESPN? You watch TV, you watch, you know, sports programs, all these satellites. Think about when Hurricane Harvey hit. How do you even know where it's going to hit? Answer, NASA, satellites. Okay. Uh, you get, I do think that it is a monument, as Ayn Rand said, I, I agree with this, it's a monument to human reason. It's a monument to the, to the national will that we actually accomplish this uh, as a country. But it also gives us a new way of looking at ourselves. Think about this, Earthrise, this is, I think, Blue Marble, the most, photo, the most famous photograph ever, uh, or most reproduced photograph ever. This occurs in 1968. When does the environmental movement get born? Right about the same time. Right about the same time. This, we, we view ourselves differently because of this. Another way to look at NASA brings enormous economic benefits around the country. Look at all the different NASA centers there, okay? And this brings economic benefits to communities. And I found this to be very interesting, okay? Note, and this was uh, right here. This was a, 
from the Stanford Research Institute. A substantial portion of the teaching staff in local grade and high schools was made up of wives and engineers and scientists on NASA projects. These women are generally well-educated, often from a more cosmopolitan environment, and thus able to bring to school children a broader experience and a greater appreciation of education than they would have otherwise. Because really, before the, in the 60s, after, until the Civil Rights Act really took hold, the only acceptable professional job for a female really was teaching. I'm not saying that's right, that's just the way it kind of was. I mean, Peggy and Lambert and Joan can tell you more than I can about that, but so this had an enormous impact, and I thought, I did a little research, Katherine Johnson in, in Langley, Virginia, all three of her children graduated from Hampton Simney College, and one of them became Guess, a public school teacher. And that, that cascades down the, down the years, I think, in important ways. But we also live in a world where we have, where we live in a world of astro culture. 2001, Space Odyssey, later turned into a movie, okay? Um, David Bowie's music, Space Oddity, Mr. Davis may be a little more familiar with that with me than me, or even Beyonce, look at a lot of the titles of some, look at some of the titles of her songs, Lift Off, Rocket, Countdown, or just more basic, uh, in Houston, an underground newspaper from the 60s, Space City, okay, or, right, the Houston Rockets, go Rockets, they start the playoffs soon enough, and then, yeah, the Astros. We live in a different conceptual world because of the space program, not just Apollo, but because of the space program. And uh, I think on that note, I'll end. I know you've been here long enough and you're probably starving, but does anybody have any questions that I could answer at this point? Yes, Anthony? Do they use the same bus? Do, do, they, do they use what? Where are they taking No, they don't use the same bus. No, no, no. So that's what you guys will remember from this, right? Look, if, if you have a question or you want a book, get a book. You can talk to me. Thank you.